Hi, right, folks. Next up, we have Mark Wainwright, who is a software engineer. I was expecting <laughs> applause for that. Come on. Big up the software engineer crowd. Thank you, Mark. Um, but is, uh, is he real or is he an artificial intelligence deepfake? Who knows? Indeed. Let's find out. Um, um, do I sound okay? Yes. Great. Uh, Great. Hi, um, I'm Mark. Um, I asked an AI to generate the background for a slide, and, and this is what I got. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, AI image generation. Uh, so what is it? Uh, why is it a big uh, story this year in particular? Um, and then I'm going to show you like basically how you do it, how it works. Uh, also have a little look at how to detect it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the potential biases and the applications. So what is it? Um, at the most basic level, you get a text box, you type in a thing that you'd like to see, and you press enter, and you get a picture of that thing. And it sounds like science fiction, um, and until this year, it basically was. But then um, the people at Cosmopolitan magazine did this. They typed in... Um, a wide-angle shot of a female astronaut walking on the surface of Mars in an infinite universe. Um, and then they put it on the cover. Uh, uh, and the, the Economist did basically the same thing. Um, uh, and the, these were in June, so they were get, doing previews of various programs which came out in July. So in, in July, you could go on Dali or Mid, uh, Mid Journey and play around with it yourself. And then in August, uh, Stable Diffusion came out. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that and uh, what that is and why it's different. Um, but first of all, we're going to look at Dali and how to use it. So uh, how to use it. Um, so th this is the Dali interface. You get a text box. You type in the thing you want, which is, in my case, is a pug Pegasus unicorn. <laughs> and <laughs> then you hit generate. and. There you go. Uh, takes about 30 seconds. Um, and mid-journey is pretty similar. Um, you, you have to go on Discord for some reason, but you type in the Discord channel, Pug Pegasus Unicorn, hit enter, and there you go. Uh, so yeah, both of these products work um, uh, on pretty much the same business model. So um, you get a few images for free, probably about 25, I think. And after that, you pay a subscription. And you end up, you end up paying sort of three to five uh, cents per image for that. And they all run on the server, on the cloud, uh, which means that they can restrict what you ask for. So you're not allowed to ask for sexual content. You're not allowed to ask for violence or gore. And on Dali, you're not allowed to ask for pictures of real people, like celebrities. Uh, but in August, as I was talking about, um, Stable Diffusion released their open source model. Um, and it's open source. So you can download it yourself and run it on your own computer. And you can remove the filter that restricts what it produces. Uh, you have to sign a license saying you're not going to do anything naughty, but <laughs> no one can stop you. <laughs> um, so that's. Um, so I think Stable Diffusion, because it's free and because it doesn't have these restrictions, I think it's going to have a much bigger impact. Uh, so we're going to look at Stable Diffusion. Uh, so this is the interface that I, I have for it. Um, it's a lot more complicated. There's a million different sliders and options and things. But ultimately, there's a text box at the top and a generate button and a Pugpexus unicorn. <laughs> uh, um, so that, that's basically how you use it. You type different things, you get images, um, and you keep the ones you like. Uh, so how does it work? Um, uh, I don't know how mid-journey works, because they won't tell me. It's a secret. Uh, but Dali and Stable Diffusion both use what are called diffusion models, uh, which is how they get the name. Um, and I'm going to explain how that works. So. Um, essentially, you start with hundreds of thousands of images from across the internet, and you know what these images are. So this is an image of a bunch of bananas. Um, and then you need to train your AI model. And to, the way to train the model is to progressively add noise to the bananas, and then give it pairs of images, and teach it to remove the noise from the image. So you would give it the you know, perfect bananas with no noise, and very slightly noisy image of the banana, and you teach it to remove the noise. And once you've done that, 
you go, you take the pair of you know, medium noisy bananas and slightly noisy bananas and teach it to remove the noise. And you go all the way back until you've got kind of my TV is broken levels of noise. And once you've done that, the, the great thing is you can give it any noise and, you know, like Michelangelo seeing David in the marble, it can see the bananas in the noise. Um, <laughs> Um, and this is great, but the, the really fantastic thing is it all runs on math, and you can, put, you can combine different concepts. Um, so you can put in two different words that have never appeared in an image together, and it will figure out a way to produce an image that combines those two concepts, uh, which is how I got the Pug Pegasus Unit Corn before, and this is how People are making you know, incredible images that you could never imagine being produced otherwise. Uh, so that's, that's how it works. Um, I want to talk very quickly about how to detect it, because I think maybe there are some skeptics here who are kind of you know, handling misinformation. And if someone posts a photo on the internet, how do you tell if it was produced by an AI? Um, and the answer is, if they've worked hard enough, you can't tell. But there are some things that, if they've been lazy, they might have left in the image that you can use to detect it. So um, the, I think the first thing to look at is the, the aspect ratio. So if you take a photo with your iPhone or with a normal camera, you normally get a rectangular image, uh, whereas all the AI models produce square images. Obviously, you can crop them. You can splice two images together. But you know if you're being maximally lazy, you'll get a square image. So if someone's posted a square photograph, I think that's probably a bit suspicious, at least, that it might be produced by an AI. Um, so what you can do is download the image and look at the metadata um, for it. There are lots of programs to look at that. Um, and again, if they've been lazy and not done anything at all to the image, um, and they've produced it with stable diffusion, um, it will literally say in the image metadata, this was produced by Stable Diffusion, version 1.4 with this seed, with this prompt, all these settings. So you've got your absolute proof there. Um, by the way, I'm only talking about Stable Diffusion for this because obviously DALI and Midjourney sort of restrict what you can produce with it. So I think people producing harmful images are most likely to be using Stable Diffusion. Um, so the, the final thing that you could use to detect it um, is something called an invisible watermark. Um, which the, the people at uh, Stability AI decided to put into every image produced. Um, and so what's an invisible watermark? So it's like a watermark, which is you know, the uh, piece of text overlaid on the image, but it's invisible, so people can't see it, but there are tools you can use to look at it, and it will tell you what's been embedded that in that image. So yeah, if you, um, and the great thing about this is that it's resistant to um, you know, changing the file format, changing the size, um, you know, the color balance, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, the, the invisible watermark in, in many cases will still be in the image. So that's, yeah, if you, if you found an image and you think maybe this is produced by an AI, um, that's the search term to look up um, and to help you detect it. Anyway, applications. Um, oh, no, bias. <laughs> So um, all of these, image, all these models are trained with you know, hundreds of thousands of in images from the internet. But the internet is full of stereotypes. Um, so uh, back in um, July, when it came out, if you ask Dali for a portrait of a software engineer, um, you get someone who looks a bit like me, a white man. Um, and I think that the people at OpenAI sort of decided they could do better than this. Um, and so they changed it. And now, that's what you get. So it's a lot more diverse. Um, and, and the way they do this is they um, insert secretly into your prompts you know, words for you know, gender and ethnicity you know, to, to produce more diverse images. And I think it's really nice that they've done this. Hopefully, Midjourney will do the same thing at some point as well. Uh, anyway, applications. Um, so the, the first thing a lot of people think is, is this going to replace all artists? Um, and you know, their suspicions were confirmed when this chap called Jason Allen won the Colorado State Fair with his, his beautiful piece of art that he made on Midjourney. Uh, and I think a lot of people were quite upset by this. Uh, 
um, I, mean, I, don't want to, I don't know if it's going to replace artists, but I do know he put an enormous amount of work into this image, and you know, he manually you know, had to go in and fix certain bits. So he was already an artist. This just helped him you know, produce better art more easily. Um, anyway, um, so stock images, uh, particularly in advertising, um, what if you could produce an advert but personalize the same image um, for the person that you're advertising to? So you've got the same image, but the person has a different gender, different ethnicity. Um, I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Wayne Wright. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've got, we've got loads of questions here, so let's try, try and get through as many. So, uh, so first question is from Aaron. Are there any restrictions on hate, for hate speech? Could I type in anti-Semitic conspiracy memes? No, no. <laughs> and generate AI horrors beyond human comprehension? Uh, um, well, I haven't tried it. Um, <laughs> there's... <laughs> um, uh, so it depends on the images that were trained by. So they may have filtered out those images in the training process, but they probably haven't. And, <laughs> and you could definitely, you know, you could combine concepts that they have included in the training images. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you wanted to do that for some reason. Uh, Anonymous asks, beyond selling magazines or to have fun on the internet, how can this be helpful to society? Um, uh, it's really fun. <laughs> is, is, is the, I mean, the main thing for me, um, sorry, also, you can, you can produce memes quite easily. So this is Leonardo by Leonardo. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think that's helpful to society. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and also, I mean, for me, like, I think it lets people who, you know, are not necessarily great artists or, you know, have great artistic talent, it helps them express themselves. And I think that's great. Uh, Anonymous asks, was LOAB an actual thing? Sorry, I, I don't know what that is. LOLAB? LOAB, L-O-A-B. Oh. oh, right. Uh, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I mind? Okay. Yeah. Um, Evan asks... Uh, is the software creating fr the subjects from scratch or copy pasting from the interweb? Um, so it's, it's so as I was showing with the noise, it, it's creating it from pure noise and it's trying to find patterns that it's recognized from the training images in that noise and then turning it into pictures. So I, I would say it's creating it from scratch, but if you type in exactly the right thing, you can sort of reproduce existing images, it's possible. But it's quite rare in my experience. Bremner is showing his weird leg fetish. Why are these things so bad at drawing legs? <laughs> um, it's, what it's particularly bad at is drawing people in particular poses. Um, and basically, it's not very good at English. Um, <laughs> um, so it does... Uh, um, if you ask for like a particular person in a particular pose, it's not very good at figuring out what you want, and it ends up drawing like some weird mess quite often. Um, I think hopefully that answers the question. Um, yeah, it's, it's bad at people basically uh, as well um, because I think we pay a lot of attention to exactly what people in photographs look like, and if they look at all wrong in any way, we pick up on that. Whereas if you've got like a landscape or a sunset. Um, you're a lot more forgiving, I think. Uh, Anonymous yeah. asks, does the invisible watermark stay detectable if something is captured by screenshot and saved separately? Uh, yes, in principle, yeah. But, I mean, it's... I, I've tested it, like, sort of quite a lot with just pe images that people have said, I've made this on Stable Diffusion. And in my experience, about half of them still had the watermark in. So it does... The more you do to the image, the more the watermark goes away, <laughs> essentially. And uh, we'll do one more from Igor. What's, what's next? AI-generated videos, music, books? Uh, yeah, people are already doing videos, because I mean, a video is just you know, a sequence of images. So they've, the great thing about Stable Diffusion is you can put it into other programs. Um, so people have made programs to produce animations and videos with it already. Uh, I think music is coming. Um, <laughs> I think books have been around for a while, actually. Uh, they're just really bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah.